Okay, welcome to this um, Y319 Civil Rights 1865-1992 walkthrough of the exam. So remember the exam is two hours and 30 minutes long and the first question that you have is an interpretations question. Evaluate the interpretations in both of the two passages and explain which you think is more convincing as an explanation of the position of African Americans during the Gilded Age. So the first thing to do is to read both passages. Passage A, impulses toward comprehensive segregation became overpowering toward the end of the 19th century as an accompaniment to the forces of modernization, the rapid development of cities, industries and transportation networks. Segregation was understood by its advocates as a thoroughly modern way to organize different racial groups and as a liberal alternative to violent encounters on one side and empowering those regarded as inferior or backward on the other. Initial legal segregation came about first in two institutions which typified the South Lurch into modernity, the new public schools and the railroads and streetcars. Segregation then spread to virtually all areas of public life, parks, theatres, waiting rooms, drinking fountains and restrooms. African Americans regarded all of these as despicable indignities and humiliations. Nevertheless, they had come to see their unit, their survival and growth as best served by turning inwards. Many were attracted to black towns, usually built around family groups. Outposts of black teachers, ministers, shopkeepers, physicians and tradesmen aimed to uplift the poor black working people. They embraced race as a symbol of dignity and pride. On both sides, the colour line was drawn more deeply than before. That's passage A. <clears throat> when you think about that in the context of what we know about African Americans during the Gilded Age, this was a, a particularly negative time for African Americans. So the fact that passage A is trying to paint things not in a positive way, but it's trying to explain how African Americans maybe embraced this segregation, which suggests that it's it's maybe downplaying some of the horror of this period for African Americans. Passage B, the rise of the populist party in the 1890s divided the white vote in the South to such an extent that it's in some places the black vote became the balance of power. Populists co courted black voters and brought blacks prominently into their councils. In response, the Bourbons, that's the southern ruling class, revived the race issue and began arguing that the black vote should be eliminated. Jim Crow segregation followed hard on disenfranchisement. Very soon, the principle of racial segregation extended to every area of southern life, including street railways, hotels, response hospitals, recreation, sports and employment. The editor of the Richmond Times expressed the very view that God Almighty drew the colour line. A few brave saw black and white and racial measures, but by and large, Blacks had to accommodate to them as best they could. The champions of a new South used the romantic myth of the old South to bolster their creed. The Bourbons led the South into a new economic era without sacrificing a mythic reverence for the old South. It's passage B talking about disenfranchisement, segregation, um, not necessarily focusing on any positive element or any sort of compensatory element of this period for African Americans and so passage B is generally painting a, a bleaker picture than passage A. As our argument for this period is that it was a particularly bleak picture, I would say that therefore makes passage B more convincing. So you would read both passages, you decide which one you think is more convincing based on what you yourself already know. And then you would <clears throat> highlight key areas that you're going to pick out from the passages. If we focus on passage A, we could talk about the forces of modernization and say, yes, segregation was seen as an alternative to lynching, violence, uh, as a way of maintaining order. Schools and the railroads and streetcars, yes, this did happen. Segregation laws in Tennessee in the 1880s and segregation of schools, for example. Spread to virtually all areas. We've talked about Plessy versus Ferguson that gave this an official Supreme Court stamp segregation and convert what had been de facto segregated into de jure segregation. Civil rights cases, slaughterhouse cases in the 1870s and 1880s were also Supreme Court decisions which undermined the 14th Amendment and paved the way for increasing segregation. Black towns, outposts of black teachers, importance of the Baptist church and leaders like Henry McNeil Turner, laying the foundations of black church was important for civil rights movement. Also, we know that because of education, literacy did improve from one in 20. To one in two. Racial pride, we talked here about Booker T. Washington a little bit, the Tuskegee Institute, to focus on black education and economic advancement. So there's plenty to say there that Passage A, you know, is convincingly arguing about. However, this is too much focus on positives. 
If many black people did not accommodate, we could talk about Ida B. Wells and the lynching campaign. We could talk about the violence that <clears throat> that really did dominate this period. We could talk about the attempt of black politicians and people to resist Jim Crow segregation is real and important and it's overlooked by this passage. And this passage seems to look at the period through this lens of a new South that offered an alternative to violence and lynching for African Americans, but in so doing it downplays the very real nature of that violence and the economic <clears throat> degradation of black people in this period. If you think about passage B, the black vote should be eliminated. Yes, we know about the struggle to exercise the vote throughout the reconstruction period and then waning northern efforts to protect it. We can talk about the force bill here, talk about grandfather clauses and literacy tests. We can talk about the fact that the last black congressman died in 1901 and the black vote and representation was wiped out by then. So definitely be a valid focus here on disenfranchisement, segregation in every area of life. Again, we can go to Plessy versus Ferguson, de jure segregation, spoke out against racist measures. We talk about Du Bois here, another African American activist, again, and the Asian campaign, the refusal to accept Jim Crow. It doesn't cover the extent of violence and economic poverty suffered, um, sharecropping, crop land, etc. It doesn't acknowledge growing black communities outside of the South experience of African Americans in northern cities who try to escape the Jim Crow South. So there's some limitations that are similar to passage A, but because it has a, a great uh, focus on the problems faced by African Americans in this period, disenfranchisement being a huge problem as well as segregation, I think that makes passage B just slightly more convincing. So our structure would be to outline what passage A and passage B say very briefly in the introduction, say which one we think is the most convincing, which is passage B. We then do strengths of passage A and limitations of passage A. We would do strengths of passage B and limitations of passage B, and then we would have our concluding judgment, which sums up why we think the passage B is probably the more valid, the more convincing explanation, simply because it focuses on disenfranchisement and segregation, which are probably the two most prominent experiences for African Americans in this period. And so that makes passage B a little more convincing. Then we've got our, so we spent maybe say, an hour, 55 minutes, an hour doing that. And that leaves us with an hour and a half. And we've got our three essays and we need to choose two. So we're going to choose this one first. We're going to choose discrimination against African Americans remained strong throughout the period 1865 to 1992. How far do you agree? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to quickly note down our political, social and economic knowledge that's relevant to this. We could talk about the Ku Klux Klan and disenfranchisement and grandfather clauses and literacy tests and all white primaries and the failure of the force bill and white citizens, citizens councils in response to the 60s civil rights movement for political the social, we could talk about violence and lynching and segregation and Plessy versus Ferguson and race rights, post-World War I and white citizens councils and anti-busing movement and Rodney King and police brutality in the 1990s. For economic, we talk about sharecropping and crop land system and the great migration to escape north, but the fail, even in the north, the facing of economic discrimination, unfair employment practices, racist administering of the New Deal, housing and employment discrimination, it's like Chicago, for example, black people disproportionately below the poverty line, a gap in average income between white and black Americans increased by $5,000 from 1950 to 1987, despite the civil rights activism of the 60s. So that's our basic knowledge about discrimination. Why was there discrimination? How might this change? So our political, social and economic is one way of looking at it, which gives us an element of synthesis here. Then the why and the other factors and the explanation of change over time helps us to develop a, a, a develop synthesis. So the most violent discrimination happened when periods of black advancement. So reconstruction in the 1960s. At other points, the government acquiesced in the discrimination. So it does not stay the same. White supremacy remains strong, but not government support for it. Similarly, again, white supremacy remains strong in, in, the, in the discrimination and social rights, but government acceptance and approval for it did not. Radical Republicans in the Reconstruction period, civil rights activism in the 1960s, attempted to force a change in attitudes, 
most successfully in the 1960s, which, seg which destroyed segregation. In the economic sphere, the discrimination against African Americans probably remained the strongest in the sense it was part of the racially loaded nature of the economic structure. Government was not prepared to deal with economic inequality in a meaningful revolutionary way. So did discrimination remain strong? Uh, yes, it did. Did it remain consistently strong and the same throughout the whole period? No, it didn't. So our line of argument is that discrimination was constant throughout the period 1865 to 1992, and white supremacy remained a strong and powerful force that motivated this discrimination. It's not valid to suggest, however, that government endorsement of this discrimination remained the same or strong throughout the whole period. During Reconstruction and the 1960s in particular, the government moved to tackle inequality and discrimination, discrimination most notably in political and social rights. And during this period, increased racial violence in response to the fact that the government was doing something. In economic discrimination and inequality remain consistently strong because the federal government was not prepared to enact measures to radically change the economic structure of the country to, to make sure that African Americans could escape from the disproportionately negative economic position that they had. So was discrimination strong? Yes, it was. Did it remain strong in the sense that it came from government and proponents of white supremacy? No, it didn't. So we can't say that discrimination against African Americans remained strong in the same way throughout the whole period. That's our argument. That's our developed synthesis. We'll have a look at this question now. This is the second one we're going to answer. So we've got 45 minutes left. We've answered our interpretation question. We've answered our first essay. And now we're going to do our quick little plan. So this question, throughout the period 1865-1992, Native Americans took little action themselves to improve their civil rights. How far do you agree? Right, well, in the political sphere, we've got the Indian Wars, which in themselves were a fight to maintain Native American political independence. We've got the Muscogee Convention in 1905, which is an attempt to create a separate Indian state. We've got the National Congress of American Indians, which was founded to try and resist the end of reservations. Got Native American Rights Fund that was founded and fought for the right to vote for Native Americans. In the social sphere, again, we've got fighting resist assimilation in the Indian Wars. We've got the Society of American Indians, which was an attempt to pressure a group of intertribal leaders to try and campaign for better education. We've got the National Indian Youth Council established to try and pursue Native American rights. We've got American Indian Movement in 1968, a militant organization. We've got the occupation of Mount Rushmore, and we've got the American Indian Movement taking over the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. In the economic area, it's, it's more difficult to find examples of Native American resistance or taking action themselves, largely powerless in this area because education and training was controlled by the Bureau of Indian, Indian Affairs, and assimilation and westward expansion was key to Natives losing land and livelihood. So there's our stuff that we have got a part of the narrative that we can start to look at, jot those things down, and then we think about why. Why was it maybe that Native Americans took little action? Well, Native Americans were, were little interested in gaining the vote for much of the period. If we're, if we're gonna if we're gonna distinguish political rights as the right to vote, as opposed to just wanting to control your own tribal political structure, then they would, they didn't want this. That's not what Native Americans were asking for. They wanted Indian rights and tribal sovereignty. The Dawes Act and the Citizenship Act destroyed culture and lifestyle, and it wasn't until the 1960s onwards where Native Americans were in a petition, position to fight for their rights. So at the start of the period, Native Americans are not fighting for the same political rights that, that white people think they should have, and they're not in a position to fight um, after the end of the 19th century until the 1960s for improved political rights. Again, in the social sphere, assimilation makes it really difficult to resist until the 1960s when there's a change in government attitude towards natives. And that leads to the 1975 Indian Self-Determination Act, the restoration of tribal sovereignty and culture. This was partly because of pressure coming from organisations like the American Indian Movement and changing attitudes. But it was also partly because of a government change of heart. The campaigns of AIM impacted on the Supreme Court, whose rulings in the 1980s, like US versus Sioux Nation, led to huge financial compensation paid out. So what we're seeing here 
is that Native Americans, it's difficult to criticise them for taking little action. They did try to take action at the start of the period by actually fighting to resist their own oppression and subjugation. And then for much of the rest of the period, they were rather helpless in the face of the assimilationist policies of the American government. Ironically, having absorbed some of this assimilation, it was Native Americans using mainstream political tactics to fight for their own rights and improve their civil rights in the 60s and 70s, which then led to Native American rights being recognized in terms of tribal sovereignty and identity rather than the sort of rights that the government wanted to bestow upon them. So our line of argument is very difficult to criticize Native Americans for not taking action to fight their own civil rights as the onslaught of assimilation, land dispossession and destruction of lifestyle and culture made Native Americans often powerless to resist the erosion of their rights. Furthermore, many of the rights they were given were not asked for and were part of the white government's attempt to assimilate them right up until the 1950s. There were attempts to resist in the Indian Wars where Native Americans fought for to save their tribal sovereignty and culture. Failure to resist assimilation meant that effective Native American protests in the post-World War II era embraced mainstream political protest and activism that did lead to a change in government policy and a recognition of tribal sovereignty. So I think we're saying there that Native Americans did everything that they actually could but at times during the period, it was incredibly difficult for them to engage in any sort of action themselves to improve their civil rights. And then he finished. Two and a half hours, one interpretation question, two essays. That's how to tackle that exam.